on this episode of On The Move. This is episode 23, and we had on saddle maker and artist Carrie Schwartz. Carrie uh, has been working in leather work for about 45 years now, he said. Um, he didn't get into making saddles until a little later in his leather working career. Um, but now he is known for his saddle making and his work with the TCAA, which I believe, um, something cowboy artist association. Is that correct, Ben? Yeah, I think it's the traditional cowboy arts association. Traditional. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we got to sit down and talk with Carrie, and he, you know, explained to us about, uh, you know, how he views leatherworking and his approach to teaching. And what was interesting that I wasn't necessarily expecting was all the parallels uh, he draws from craftsmanship to horsemanship, um, which made a lot of sense to me when he was talking about it. Um, but that was kind of a a cool way of thinking about it I wasn't expecting to hear tonight. Yeah, it was great to talk with him and hear his viewpoint on that process of needing to learn to learn in order to learn. That That's the first step is you have to learn to... I kept thinking of getting out of your own way because we talk about that all the time. But Kerry's an amazing artist and craftsman and his attention to detail is second to none. So to hear him talk about his path to getting into that all the way back to his upbringing was uh, super eye-opening. There's less and less people like that. Uh, and not to be like a doomsdayer, right? But it does seem like there's sort of a an epidemic of lack of work ethic in our country and, and new craftsmen or kind of anybody coming up into the workforce. So I'm glad that Kerry's doing that as the Patreon deal that he's doing and teaching people because he, he's the generation that we really need. They have a lot of work ethic and definitely so glad to have Kerry on here. Great to have him as a, as a guy out there teaching people. Absolutely, man. If, uh, if making saddles was what I was interested in, I would be consider myself very fortunate to have someone who's uh, dedicated himself and and really been that detail oriented about everything, and someone who's made a, a quite the effort to not just be good at their craft, but be better at teaching their craft. That uh, that makes a big difference. So. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, this will be episode 23 with Carrie Schwartz. Hope you enjoy it. That's true. But then you do get the occasional person give you, I'm sure it's the same with saddles. You get the occasional person gives you a phone call and you're like, how did my name ever get out there? Why? And why are you coming to me? (laughs) Yeah, that's happened. Although, um, yeah, I can only think of one guy in 40 years that actually really hated the sound of his voice. But, uh, he, he was a good customer, but boy, he, he just liked, he liked to talk way more than I liked to listen to what he had to say. So, but, uh, hmm. I get pretty good people. The phone, the phone isn't a deal for me. I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm probably considered kind of halfway unapproachable. So I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> Keep my phone for me. Yeah, that's funny. Well, Bill and I were talking about that on Sunday because we went and looked at a couple of horses, and this lady was trying to sell us on these horses because they're performance bred and all that, you know, and how some of these horses had the possibility of, you know, winning a couple million dollars and 
sounded pretty grand, you know, and it'd be some great bragging rights. But Bill and I were talking about how, <laughs> like so many of these people, they want to get into it and there's not a great chance of actually winning any of that money, but there's a pretty good chance of having some stuff to talk about. But at the end of the day, you know, like we're not the kind of guys that need anything to talk about, but you wouldn't mind the money. So you're kind of barking up the wrong tree the way that lady was trying to sell us these horses, you know, but to a lot of people, they'd rather have something to talk about, even if the money never comes, than have nothing to talk about and maybe have a little money come. <laughs> Strange how that works out sometimes. Yeah. So are we live and recording or what? Yeah. Yeah, we hit record. We are now. We're rolling. We are now. Cool. Yeah. How have you been? Are you in your shop there? Yeah, this is a little office space I got in my shop. It's just in the basement of my house. So we built this house in 2009 and and made it with this daylight basement. And it's it's pretty pretty sweet. I've had some caves that I've had my shop in over the years and stuff. This is about as sweet as I've ever had it. Lots of natural light and it's probably what. 800 square feet. It's more than I need, but it seems like whatever space you have, you use it. You fill it up with <laughs> stuff. So, yeah, I, um, uh, so I, I went to school at Virginia Tech and got a, uh, an industrial engineering degree. And we call that induced demand. You know, like you go into town and if you add an extra lane, on the road, you're still going to have traffic because people are using all three lanes instead of two lanes, you know? <laughs> Virginia Tech. Blacksburg? That... Yes, sir. Yeah. Virginia That's impressive Tech. for someone who's out in Idaho to know that, honestly. Well, it's, uh, wasn't it Frank, Frank Beamer? Wasn't that the football coach out there? And so... Yes, sir. Yeah. Some things I remember and some things I don't remember at all. <laughs> you can ask my yeah. wife about that. That's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. I saw Frank Beamer on TV on Saturday because his son coaches uh, South Carolina now. Okay. So I was watching them cool. beat Clemson. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Virginia yeah. Tech was it Michael Vick, wasn't he a quarterback one time? Yeah, yeah. Virginia so Tech the and... first the first college football game I ever went to, Michael Vick was there and he was the quarterback. Oh wow. Yeah. And I, I, I mean I was like four or five years old, so I didn't I didn't understand at the time what I was seeing, but yeah, so I, I grew up being a big Michael Vick fan. Um, which, you know, was obviously kind of polarizing at times because of his career, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Sound like you're kind of a football fan, Kerry. Well, sort of. I'm not, not that big really. I, I, I watched a game. I think it was a pro football game here a couple of weeks ago. I think it was the first game I'd seen in a couple of years, to be honest with you. So, but I'm, you may have heard of Boise State Broncos and the Blue Field and stuff. Of course, that's, that's, I follow teams like that and stuff. And offensive coordinator at Boise State is a, a guy that I went to Boise State with years and years ago. He's, his name was Dirk Cutter. He was a head coach of the Atlanta Falcons um, mm. a few years ago. Yeah. Stuff. I remember him. When you, when you know there's when there's somebody that yeah I don't remember much about him and I'm almost certain he had, he doesn't remember me at all but but uh, when you have kind of a personal connection like that it kind of creates a little bit of interest I'm that way about a lot of stuff so I have a small interest in many things. <laughs> so you went yeah. to Boise State then you said. I did. I went there for a couple of years and was a college dropout. And, and uh, I did pretty good in school, but <clears throat> I just 
I just didn't didn't know what I wanted out of it. And uh, so the truth is, I I dropped out and kind of headed for the high desert and became kind of a I guess you'd say kind of a mountain man. I I I went and trapped coyotes and bobcat for a couple of winters and did it uh, on the back of a mule, no less. And, oh man, uh, what was the in- inspiration for that? You know, I I was always I always was like the hunting and getting out in the woods and the mountains and all that kind of stuff. I'd always been that way. So <clears throat> I was sitting around drinking a beer with a buddy of mine in his apartment in Twin Falls one time, and we were talking about, oh, you know, we ought to go up. But his family had a ranch up in, up near the Utah border, and we got talking about that. And <clears throat> I told him, Tom, we're, we're going to sit here and talk about this all night. We just need to make a plan. And we met, we were both single and didn't have really any big plans of doing it much of anything. And so we went and lived in this this uh, shack. <laughs> it's, I'm telling you guys some stuff that I haven't told many people, but um, <clears throat> we lived in this old shack where the only heat in the place was a monarch wood-burning cook stove. And that was also, of course, what we cooked on. And I remember getting up in the mornings in the middle of the winter and there'd be ice on a bucket that was on a table that we had inside the door. And it was just a, it was literally a shack that we lived in. And and the second winter we were in there, the only way that we got around was horseback. We couldn't, we couldn't go anywhere. We didn't have vehicles or snow machines or anything that could get around at all. So... I about that time in my life, I'd spent more time horseback in the winter than I did in in the summer months. Hmm. So didn't know anything. It was just dumb as a post as far as horsemanship and that kind of stuff. But made some really stupid mistakes and all that good stuff. Never had them. Neither of us really knew that much about it. But we just jumped in with both feet and. And I rode a Foss saddle, a really, really nice made saddle that I got from a friend. It was hand hand built in Twin Falls, Idaho. And uh, that was the winter of 1980, 81, I think it was. 80, 81 was the first winter we were in there. So, hmm. That's went awesome. Went on to do some packing and guiding in the Selway Bitter at Wilderness. And uh, so that spent a lot of time dragging a string of nine mules. And uh, let's see, we had actually eight mules in a bell mare in one string, all loaded. So, <clears throat> and that's where that's where I learned how to, uh, I, I first really got acquainted with Ray Hole's Saddle Company. There's a saddle shop here in Idaho, still in operation started back in the 30s as we the guy that i worked for he had all gray holes riding saddles and and later on i found out that all of the deckers were built on ray holes pack saddle trees and they were made by somebody you've heard of by the name of dale harwood back in the 70s he i was just talking to dale about that just i don't know a month or so ago and I said that I was pretty sure he'd made those pack saddles back, of course, before he was really had the, the stock saddle business going. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, he he said, yeah, I probably did make those. He did some work for the guy that I worked for there. Hmm. So, so during that time you were staying in the cabin, you weren't. You hadn't gotten into saddle making by then. That was before any leather working no. or anything like that. I actually, I actually was, uh, I'd done quite a bit of leather work by that time, but I hadn't built my first saddle. I didn't build my first saddle until 1982. So it's exactly 40 years ago, 
right now when I finished my very first saddle. And uh, so it was it was a couple of years before that. And but I I started working leather professionally in 1979. I worked in a gun holster shop in Twin Falls, Idaho. <clears throat> and uh, so that was that was what I guess you would call a, a high end production uh, company. They were making some really, really nice, high quality gun holsters for Thompson Center Arms Company from, I believe they're in New Hampshire. And um, so I, I wrangled a job there and I had already had some experience in leather for years before that, just doing hobby stuff. And um, so I wrangled a job there. A cousin of mine was working there and that was, you know, I would have been a spring of, 1979 and then i went on when i went to boise state i worked part-time at a couple of different leather shops in boise idaho and so by the time i built my first saddle i had in 1982 i had i had professional experience in three different shops in leather work so coming up on 45 years uh, professional leather work with with some of that you know some of that mountain man stuff sprinkled in there for uh, for spice i guess here and there yeah yeah I, when i the second winter we were let, staying in this shack i i i had this job waiting for me in this leather shop in twin falls and and one day i woke up and decided okay i guess i'm done with this mountain man thing um found my way out of the mountains and and uh Came out of there in a 1941 half ton Chevy pickup with a friend of mine. And we were just came out of there pretty grungy looking and, and got cleaned up and went to work in the leather shop. And then it was later that year, 1982, then I went to a trade school in Spokane, Washington. Yeah. And that's where I learned how to build saddles. Well, hmm. that, that's kind of something that I want to ask you about like nowadays, you know, word on the street around most businesses is you keep hearing uh, good help is hard to come by. Can't find good help. And I imagine when Carrie Schwartz first came along to learn to build saddles or, or work for a leather company, he was probably some pretty damn good help. Um, or, or I don't know how you grew into that or if that was natural, but looking at your work, like there's a lot of good makers out there. And I haven't seen tons of saddles, but looking at your work, even just the stitching, it's obvious that you are like obsessive over getting things perfect and taking your time and sort of going the extra mile to do it, do a beautiful job. Like your, your leather work to me is like art. And is that something like, tell me a little bit about that. Did you grow into that or is that something that you were raised with and you've always sort of had that work ethic and the way you deliver not only working hard but like putting that level of just intricacy and and care into your work boy that's a loaded question <laughs> I, I i'd have to say of course you go back to the way you were raised that's a lot of it um my my i'm 100 percent german ancestry i don't know if i can blame that or thank it <laughs> thank my for that but but uh <clears throat> pretty fussy i mean i both my parents were perfectionists but i think that in nowadays when you say perfectionism that's almost like a dirty word isn't it and i don't think it should be i i mean it can be but you guys, you guys know what I'm talking about. That's how you take your work to the next level. But I think it's fascinating the study of how people improve. And for the most part, we don't improve at the point of a stick. We improve because we want to improve. And that's the way it was for me. I, my, my parents gave me a ton of freedom. But it was all within a very, I would say, a very highly structured environment. You ate at a certain time, 
you, I grew up on a farm. There was, this is, this was our regimen. We had this very systematic rhythm of our days and stuff. And, and, uh, yeah, I, I remember sitting on a tractor for hours and hours and hours and it was pretty boring work, but it was still it. And I did to answer your question further, uh, the artsy fartsy thing that I got going, that's, that was, that started early. Uh, in fact, I'm, I think Joe and I were talking on the phone the other day, I ran across his number and did you want a saddle? And I couldn't even, by my notes, I couldn't even tell you for sure if you, <laughs> I couldn't, I know we talked, but I couldn't remember what we talked about. And I probably apologize and blamed it on my artsy fartsy ways and stuff. And I'm not all, oh, to be honest with you, this doesn't sound like a very good endorsement of my character, but I'm, I'm pretty things get pretty scattered around here and stuff. And I guess I'll blame it on the, the art part of my brain, which tends to be uh, towards more of the chaos and less order side of things. But I, when I grew up though, that structure is what I, I would have to say, that's, if you take that out of the equation, I would not be the saddle maker. I wouldn't even be the sa a saddle maker. I'd have to be some, I wouldn't be able to be self-employed because I, you have to have a systematic way that you approach business and all of that kind of stuff. And truth be told, I, I have just enough of that <laughs> to have stayed in business for as long as I have, to be quite honest with you. But I, I think that <clears throat> early experience in that leather shop and that holster shop, it was a production shop, but we we were the guy that owned the place and and everybody that worked there was pretty pretty fussy there was nothing going out of there that was that was second rate and if there was a skip stitch on any of the holsters it went in this they called it factory seconds they did it was sold as as something that was of second quality so that was really important for me to, to, it had that same, there was no artistic expression going on in there, but, but standing there sewing holster bodies for eight hours a day, by the time I was 19 years old, I'd had probably more, <clears throat> more hours on a harness stitcher, a sewing machine, a needle and all machine than a lot of saddle makers have in an entire career. Cause I would stand there for eight hours a day for five days a week hmm. and so, and so, and so I didn't know how to fix a machine when it broke down, but I dang sure knew how to run it. I really learned how to run it. I got really, really familiar with the machine. So by the time I built my first saddle, I, I had a lot of experience in tools and equipment and what leather could do, what it couldn't do and that sort of thing. Sure. So let me ask you this, Carrie, because we've talked about this in past podcasts, um, kind of talking about horses, but I, I think it applies, like I've said before, it applies to almost anything that's art. Um, and, and I kind of hearken it back to music. You almost have to learn all the rules so you know how to break all the rules later to be an artist. Um, and for example, in music, you know, obviously you think of great musicians in any genre of music that they, they've done things that are unique, um, to them that have stood out and in a way, you know, kind of broken the mold, but it's all within, you know, all those people, for example, if they're guitarists, they had to learn how to play their scales first and get really good at understanding the scales and everything like that. Um, and you know, I, I would say horses, um, especially starting colts to a degree it is similar because there's like a checklist of things you need them to do, but not every horse is the same. So you need to understand how to work within that checklist, what horse might need more, what horse might need less. Um, and from what you're saying, it sounds like 
that time in those shops, it really put that structure into you. But, you know, do you feel like that helped you later on have a deeper understanding of how to be a better artist and a better maker? Absolutely. And, and uh, the parallels be with craftsmanship slash artistry and horsemanship, there's re- a really, really strong connection. It's all the same stuff, really is. And I think you, Joe, did a very good job of, of describing some of those dynamics. That you, get, you have this very systematic way that you approach what you do, but it's, there's a certain amount of flexibility within that, that system. And, and I think that's the challenge is sometimes we get plugged, whether it's horsemanship or craftsmanship, we, we sometimes get kind of plugged into a, a certain routine of, of how to do things. And then to the point of being a little bit too rigid and, and there's never more perfect example of that than horses that the colt is writing the rules. I mean, if you're going to say there's any rules to follow, that cold is telling is feeding you information every moment that you're within its presence. And the same way with craftsmanship with leather and trees and hardware and all that stuff, the medium writes the rules. The leather is going to tell you what, what you can or can't do. And every piece of leather is a little bit different. It's not going to kill you <laughs> like making a bad mistake with a cold or a horse, but, uh, but, but some of the parallels I think are, are really striking. And, and, uh, I do a fair amount of teaching and, and of course people come to me to learn how to f- stamp flowers and stuff. That's what I've been known for. But, uh, I, I presented in a very, very systematic way, but I presented in a way that that right now within the last two, three years, in a way that I'm trying to help people learn how to learn. And that sounds a little mm-hmm. cryptic, but it's it's uh, I'm I'm offering sort of a, a systematic package where where you can learn how to advance your skills. And and a big part of that is learning how to learn, because as adults, somewhere along the way, many times we, a lot of people, way too many people quit learning. So sometimes we have to relearn how to learn. That that yeah. makes absolute sense. Yeah, I. Yeah, I like that quote a lot. Um, what you said about the medium writes the rules. You could probably say that about any form of art, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I also like what you said about learning how to learn. Um, I remember when I got to school, uh, the um, one of the professors I had for general engineering, he said something very similar. He said, you're going to be here for four years and you're going to learn some fundamentals, but realistically whoever hires you after you get this degree they're going to go and train you to do the job that they want you to do so the best thing you can do here is learn how to be successful within the curriculum learn how to learn and because you're going to have to go and do this over once you get hired somewhere so kind of a similar message but yeah i like that a lot that's a good approach well, and that's interesting if we're talking about this spreading to all parts of society. You know, you can see that with uh, with science, for instance, right? In our country, it used to be science was learning. It was like a constant state of learning and evolving and searching. And so when as a society we start calling science the science and, and making it sound like something that stands on its own and it's hallowed doctrine, you must listen. I mean, just that's a glowering example of of people not learning, learning to staying in that uh, in that space where they have their mind open and they're learning to think critically. And your decisions come from a place of taking in information, processing it, 
getting advice, thinking, comparing, remembering, all that stuff, and then saying, here's what we have presently that we believe is the best, and then your mind's still open if something else comes along. But you don't just camp out mm-hmm. and say, hey, this is, this is how I'm going to do it. This is the best, and um, anything else that comes along that's from someone else, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. So that that's very interesting because you see no, that. I, I agree a hundred percent. That it's uh, what I what I try to teach my students, and I, and actually, <laughs> I feel awkward even saying the word students because really what it comes down to is I have people in class, and of course they're paying me for my time and stuff and for the information, but really we're, I consider us fellow travelers. It's just that I'm a little bit perhaps further down the line uh, on this journey of craftsmanship and artistry and horses for that matter. And uh, so, yeah, it's learning is I'm, I've, I've developed in a, an addiction to it. I, I don't, it's doing something new and, and uh, these days exploring the dynamics of learning has been a really fascinating thing too. Um, and I know that there's a lot of studies done on this, but to me, the mo- one of the most fascinating things is to, <clears throat> is what happens right on the edge of your abilities. And I would say that there's a certain energy that happens and we know now that there, when you extend what your abilities just beyond what you've done before, you get a little bit of a dose of dopamine. And you know how it is. You guys have been on a horse or you, whatever you're learning. And you, wow, I, I just did something. Music's another good example. I just did something on this musical instrument that I had not done before. And it makes your day. And it's just a little, it, what it is, is a little d- dose of dopamine that helps keep your head in the game. And, and I, I know you, were, you, you interviewed Bill Barnes the other day, and, and we often, I think, talk about how, oh, it's taken so much hard work to get to where we've done and a lot of effort and so on and so forth. But I had asked the question, what's, I mean, what is the mechanism that's kept our head in the game. And I would have to say that little, that little shot of dopamine right at the edge of our abilities is where the, if you want to call it magic, there, that's where the magic happens. And it, and with horses, it's what's really cool is when, when you're doing it with an animal, you made it, you made, you did a little something, you, he, you, reach for him you picked up the reins and you had some energy coming up through his withers and and there's that feeling that that you chase and and nothing less will do and and that's to me that that there's just so much to say about that that process of learning that once you once you kind of get a, a a dose of that then you start chasing it but I, I would have to say, though, that I think while most people have that capability, I don't see too many dopamine junkies out there. <laughs> not, not, not nearly not enough, like right? some of the people I've known. Yeah. It doesn't seem like, I don't know. Because I teach a lot of people, and so I, you know, you teach, when you teach people, you can see, okay, they just, and usually I, I've done it enough where I can identify, I can see, okay, they, they just got the shot. <laughs> they, just, <laughs> they just mainlined a little bit of dopamine. I can tell it the moment it happens, you can see when it happens. And I'm sure in a clinic or whatever with horsemanship, you can see when people make a breakthrough. It's their expression, the horse's expression, the person's expression and that sort of thing. And to me, that's so fascinating. That's what keeps our head in the game, isn't it? I mean, if it's all just obligation and hard work and effort and all that kind of stuff, well, after a while, you'd get tired of that. If, 
if there wasn't something in it for you. So, Kerry, what's your approach then to implementing that when you're working with your your students, the, the people that you're you're working with? If you see them struggling and they're not getting to that next place, and you're you just know they need to have a little dose, how, how do you implement that to help them? That's really really hard. That's really tough. And Tom Doran said one time he. What you're doing at the horse, you're trying to set them up so that they find it. And it's the same way with any of these clinicians going around. What they're trying to do is they're trying to set up a situation so that their their students will find it. And uh, so oftentimes uh, some of this, it, it's, it's really, really hard to articulate it because you're talking about a feeling most of the time. And especially with with the art part of it. Uh, so what I do with a series of exercises is try to set things up. And I'm I'm not doing all this stuff out of whole cloth. I I borrow a lot of uh, teaching methods from from the art part of part of it from a, an art teacher from a hundred years ago, who who I think uh, has did some groundbreaking work that's that's been really helpful and 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 some people just latch on to it right away and other people man i i don't think they're ever going to get it and i'm sure it's the same <laughs> way with horsemanship you you can set things up and set things up and you package and you repackage and and words can only do so much but i did i did have something ha uh, happen here all oh, it's been quite a few years ago now i had a rancher from up the river here was starting to build a few saddles on the side and and i've always been talking about we need to learn how to respect forms and it comes down to joe what we were talking about a moment ago how um the 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 medium writes the rules well with forms and what we're talking about is say we're cutting the saddle seat out what's going on with this fork there's what what shape do we cut this seed out and uh so we need to respect the form of that because it's telling giving us information on what's going to work well with this and this rancher he he never said he didn't understand it but he 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 just you know i guess thought about it for a while and then he and then uh, one time he was sitting in the shop and i was describing it probably in a little bit different way and he sat back in his seat and he says, I've been hearing you say that for two years and I just now understood. It. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, so, it, and he's not a dumb guy. I mean, it, it, was, it had nothing to do with his intelligence. It's just, some of this sounds very abstract. And yeah. I know horsemanship is the same way. It sounds very, very out, abstract. When Ray Hunt says, oh, did you see that change? Or you're looking for, um, a change after a change, things like that. It's, for somebody who's not been around that, it sounds extremely esoteric. It's mysterious. It's only certain people have this special knowledge. And uh, so, yeah, which is not true. It's just that different people absorb information in different ways. Yeah, it's a, it's a great analogy to all the problems that you have in life, and more and more, like I, I less and less care about any of the success I'll ever have at this, and I'm more and more grateful to just have it in my life, and I'm convinced that it's, it's the thing for me to kind of mirror my problems off of, and all the other things in my life, all the junk and you know, the relationships you're trying to get better at and any sort of business pursuits or ideals, even weighing your expectations um, against what you're learning every day, trying to get better on a horse and pursuing, like, like being on the pursuit with all of your heart to the best of your abilities, but also not, not putting a whole, 
not laying all your hopes and dreams on this, the monetary success or, or even notoriety and what you would do with horses that other people would see, but more pursuing what you feel yourself. And, and of course, the horse will tell you if you're, if you're on the right track or not. And I'm, I'm more and more grateful for that, that aspect. And I'm sure, like saddle making for you, there's folks out there with all kinds of projects in their life that have a similar effect, but I know for me, I don't, I don't think anything would be like a horse is in that sense. I, I think that's a really good attitude to have there, Ben. I, um, and what you described there, I think is, is just simply managing expectations. And, um, I think that the incrementalism that comes with just being satisfied with with incremental improvements, and then occasionally you might make some significant breakthrough. And and wow, I made a big jump today. Say you went and talked to so-and-so or you went to a clinic or, or whatever, and in my case, somebody um, said something and you can learn something from just about anybody that walks in the door. Um, even if they're not leather workers, I've learned some stuff from welders who remember years ago, a guy welder came in the shop and says, Oh, I, I see you're not doing X, Y, Z. And, and he was just making an observation. And I realized that, wow, I, I just, I'm just going to change what I just did. And I'd never done it the same way again. And, and to me, that's, that's exciting to, that's where that, that, uh, chasing that, that feeling of, of having learned something. And I, I think all of this is wrapped up in, in, uh, one of the, to me, uh, in my opinion, one of the great, um, I guess you might say deficits and problems that our country faces is, is, uh, centers on the fact that we're starved for hands-on accomplishment. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, there's nothing more hands-on than horsemanship and craftsmanship and artistry. And, uh, but you look around, there's a lot of people that don't have that. They don't know what it's like to, to live on the edge of your abilities and that feeling that you get when you advance to your abilities by just a little bit. And a lot of people just don't have that. And, uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons why, why I, teach that what I do I got this patreon thing going kind of an online learning center and and of course it's turned into a little bit of a cash deal but but it's also kind of scratches that itch of teaching people and and um, being able to give them the opportunity to find out what it's like to advance their skills all under this larger umbrella of of uh, hands-on accomplishment. So you talk about that to the ranching and the farming and the craftsmanship world, and you're preaching to the choir. But, but there's a vast majority of people out there that they, they have no idea what that's like. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about your Patreon deal. How's that going? How, how long have you had that up for? Patreon, I, I started, we're probably about 14 months in, something like that. And, and it's going pretty good. Um, I think that it's what I, and to be honest with you, um, I, one of the things that made me excited about coming on you guys' podcast is I got plans of, of having one on there before too long and interview people like, I don't know if he'd agree to it, but my good buddy, Dale Harwood and Shep Herman, Herman Oak Leather Company. I mean, there's a pretty long string of people that some great minds out there that have something to say about craftsmanship and artistry and saddles and horses and the relationship of the whole package. Deal. Yeah. So I got that planned on there. I've, I've got a lot of video content, tutorials, um, I think last time I checked on there, I got like 
95 posts on saddle construction. And so here I'm this flower stamping guy, but I think I, I've got a lot more actual content on there for, for saddle construction than I do flower stamping. Man, you a hundred percent should do a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's going good. I, I really, well, and, and I, like Joe and I talked the other day, I think about this. Why are, why are you guys doing this? Partly for yourself. It's a learning opportunity for you guys and you get access to some minds outside of your world and it's all that learning experience for you. That's what it would be for me too. I'd, I'd very much like to hear what people say about just an unfiltered, raw, no editing, just this is a straight up conversation we're having about uh, saddle trees and horses and all of that kind of stuff. My deal is going to be behind a paywall. That's the difference, though. <laughs> well, well, we're men of the people, Gary. Pardon me, Joe. <laughs> I said, well, we're men of the people, Gary. <laughs> I see. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I'm not. <laughs> well, I haven't said this to anybody, but I, but I, my plan is probably to say if you did have. Um, some of this content and I would tell people I didn't know this is I have to have a paywall because I frankly I'm just not at this point in my life I'm not going to do it for free I'm just not yeah. uh, I'm not going to be able to I'm, I'm not going to be able to break away and get it done for nothing uh, but I do have plans say within a year or so make all of that content you know, then, then, uh, make that available, say on Spotify or whatever. And, uh, so that's kind of what I yeah. have planned. Yeah. Joe and I figure we can do this for about 25 years, doing a podcast every week and do it for free. And by then we'll have put in that work and then they'll be coming with buckets of cash. We'll be, we'll be fending people off left and right. And, uh, that'll be our story. There you go. <laughs> we'll be telling some young Whooper snapper someday. <laughs> well, it, there's no reason we shouldn't take advantage of some of this stuff. And, and, uh, you know, podcasts, there's, I listen to them. You guys probably listen to them. Um, it's a good way to have extended, listen in on extended conversations like what we're having here tonight. It's a, uh, it's a good way to get inside people's heads and, great medium yeah well and, and even for us producing this thing for me it's the discipline of every week you know of course we love talking to, to people like you and and everyone else we've had on but it's the discipline of every week finding a guest doing the show putting it together editing it making the art uploading it and uh it's a discipline it's it's something every week and and there's times where I don't know if Joe feels this way, but every now and then you're kind of like, ah, I don't know. Maybe we ought to just skip a week, you know, but then you go, nope, that's, that's resistance. Nope. We're doing it. Got to do it every week. And it's just one more thing in your life where it's a, every week you got to do it. And sure enough, it's the funnest thing. Every time you do it, no matter if you had a long day, you barely make it on time or whatnot, but boy, when you sit down and, turn on your gear and talk with somebody and even the times when it's just Joe and me, man, it's great. You get to kind of hang out with your buddy and talk and you feel great afterwards. It's like working out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're working out a bunch or not, but sometimes you don't want to do it, but if you make yourself start and then you get through a little workout and you get done and you feel great and then just go on with the rest of your day. Well, I, I know some of the, I suppose, breakthroughs that I've experienced over the years have been through conversations with my son or with uh, guys like you uh, and uh, sitting around a, in a hotel lobby with a 
bunch of TCAA guys or whatever and giving you some really, really good stuff to think about and whatnot. That's what, what we've described is community. And that's the great thing about this technology is we can build a community over, you guys are probably 2,500 miles away from me right now. That's, that's a great, great vehicle to build community. And somebody said one time when, when quality sticks together, quality will survive. And, and I think I don't want to make that sound uppity or condescending or anything, but I, I think that's how we improve one another. Iron sharpens iron, uh, to borrow a biblical phrase. It's, it's, uh, one of those things where you said something that I'll be thinking about and vice versa. That's how we grow together. Oh, amen, brother. I think you hit a nail on the head because when, when Joe and I first got around this horsemanship early on, you could see how divisive it could get with all these people. And especially, you know, how men are our natural tendency. We start jicking and jiving and trying to be better. And, and a lot of times we forget that to be better instead of pushing the other guy down, you just have to work harder. But a lot of times it seems easy to separate yourself by lowering the other guy. And you're like, Hey, don't I look good up here? So we, you could see that in this horsemanship, it, it could be easy for all these people, no matter what level you're at, um, even down at my level, you could, you could be pursuing this so hard that you allow that to drive you apart from your friends or develop a little, little bit of animosity. Instead, the same effect could be that you could draw closer together, and that's what's great about this and man i hope you do do a podcast because i think that's an important ingredient especially nowadays we already have the social media so everybody sees what the other guys are doing and but you're not talking you're just seeing pictures of each other and you see advertisements for so-and-so's clinic or so-and-so's doing this and so the ability to kind of get on here and talk i think that kind of helps bring people together that way if we're all going to be pursuing something at a high level you don't, you have less of that. You have less of the thing coming in that pushes everybody apart where you're trying to see who's better and you have more understanding. Like you said, you see inside of somebody's head. Um, I won't mention the name, but there was a podcast with a guy who's a horse trainer that, I mean, we've ragged on for years and he, he's not inside of like this, uh, the, the Brandman or the Ray Hunt, Tom Doran style horsemanship, but he's a guy who sort of, you know, Joe and I have joked it's like the antichrist to what we do. But, I, you know, you listen to an interview with him, and you're like, you get where they're coming from. And so whether you agree with them or not, you, you have a certain amount of peace about where someone's coming from. You're like, oh, they're a human. They, You start to see the trail of their life. You're like, that's that's kind of cool. He probably got to be like that because that guy, when he was 13, told him that, and he was influenced by this, and, you know, maybe was – impoverished or came from a wealthy household or you just see where people came from and you get done listening to their story no matter whether you totally agree with them or not you remember you all came from the same place you're all people and um and they're just a product of their environment and their own choices and you know that could be you you don't you're not so different but well that's true we've all had had opportunities and roadblocks and i really consider it a miracle that i've stayed in business as long as i have uh, people kind of chuckle when they hear that but uh, the reality is that a lot of planets had to line up in just such a way in order for that to, to happen and me being sitting here talking to you guys i i feel blessed beyond measure for the opportunities I've had, so much of it was in spite of myself. There was a lot of a lot of stuff that just quite literally landed in my lap, and you found a way to make the most of it, and the rest is history. Hmm. But yeah, I, I, I've been considered, you know, t- top of the food chain, all that kind of stuff. But I, day to day, I. I don't even think about that. Um, 
that you have people say, oh, you got this going and that going and stuff. And uh, <laughs> part, a good part of it's a little bit embarrassing and stuff because um, I go, go to Oklahoma City to a fancy show, fancy clothes, fancy everything and sell stuff for a lot of money and all that kind of thing. And, and I come home and my wife says, can you take out the trash? <laughs> <laughs> so, life it as a way of, of uh, hum, humbling you, and, and uh, that's a good thing. That's good stuff. Yeah. And as long as you, you know, we talked about the medium kind of writing the guidelines or the rules, that sort of thing. You think you got it dialed in, <laughs> and. It only mattered time. Before. It was a lot, a lot of years before I ruined a saddle seat to a place where I just couldn't even use it, cutting the saddle seat out. Well, I was quite a few years in when that happened. I probably thought, may, may have thought, I don't know, well, I probably won't have that happen. And I probably ruined more than one since then. Well, come to think of it, I think I ruined one earlier this fall. I got it nice piece of leather up there. I don't know if I'll ever use it again. So, so you can get your butt kicked when you think you got it all figured out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Pride cometh before the fall. That's the phrase I was thinking about. Yes. Hey, I wanted to ask you a technical question about saddle making when it comes to saddle fit. Sure. I've, I've heard a lot of different things and especially with the high quality custom, you know, weighed saddles, how important is it to have a saddle measured to a particular horse versus I guess not how important what's better to have a horse specifically measured for a saddle or have a good quality saddle tree. That's just a certain shape that would fit a variety of horses. Um, so you don't give them sores and stuff like that. Boy, you, you plowed up a stump there. <laughs> oh yeah. That's uh, I was wondering if this would come, come up in for discussion and, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I've been on record. I, I remember James, my friend Jameson Parker did an article for Western Horseman. It's been quite a few years ago now, but, but, uh, I think he interviewed Chuck Storms and Dale and Steve Meekum. Um, myself seems like there was maybe one or two other people. And, and, uh, at that time, that's been maybe 10, 12 years ago or so. And, and we all agreed that it, that was pretty, that was pretty risky business to try to be fitting individual horses. Um, and that for the obvious reasons, of course, that horse could be, especially if he were a little bit kind of kind of an oddball type of horse tough to fit and you've got this saddle that's going to fit only him and not the next horse and and uh so i on on stuff like that i definitely i if i were to err on the side of anything it's on the side of being conservative i don't tend to what i do i ask general questions as to the confirmation of the horse and and I'm not a tree maker. I've been getting my saddle trees now for over 30 years from Warren Wright, who's built over 5,000 saddle trees since 1969 in a one-person one shop. And uh, so I figured I defer a lot of judgment over to him. And uh, what, what, he, what I want him to deliver for me is what I think you can, could consider his best average and and uh not that we don't change anything with if somebody says oh we're riding most of this uh western family line of uh, morgan horses or mules or or only thoroughbred horses stuff like that then i'll make some considerations for that with the understanding that that it was made for that particular uh style of confirmation and uh, so, but having said that, I know that this Dennis Lane system that you may have heard about, uh, it's a 
a system of cards. I think Dennis is uh, Australian and developed this very systematic way of measuring a horse's back, both in in the, the angles in the front, but also the rock. And uh, I've been around that a little bit, I, and I'd like to be more conversant on, on how that actually works. But uh, if I were to take that information and, and uh, email my, an order to Warren Wright, he wouldn't know what to do with it. So, uh, so there's that too. Uh, there's, there's some yeah. guys that are kind of plugged into this, that system and, and, and those, those readings from those cards are meaningful to some people, but not for others. And, uh, so what's interesting to me, if you go back, uh, 30 years, and I think we can pinpoint pretty much right at 30 years ago was where people started referring to the bars on a saddle tree in the, in terms of degree of angles. And then you start hearing 90 and 93 and maybe even 95 and all of that kind of stuff. And, and uh, so <clears throat> people just leaped at that information as if it were a useful number that was going to be applicable to all settings and to every tree maker. And it's not. There's a number of different uh, factors and variables that are going to going to change whether uh, that degree of angle is even going to be useful for a particular horse. So, so I'm to answer your question. I mean, we can get a lot deeper than that on on that that stuff. But I'm I'm not an advocate of uh, of changing a whole bunch of stuff for for to accommodate a particular animal. And I, I know my buddy Chuck Storms, he's of course made saddle trees for many years and and he just flat maintains at a 90 degree bar. His version of a 90 degree bar is gonna fit 90% of the horses. And what we have to, as you probably, you guys probably understand, you've got a degree of angle is one thing, but, you, but then you have the distance between those bars as another variable too. So we can change the distance between the bars and not change the angles. And that's going to, that's going to make a difference from one horse to the next as well. So I would, I'd also say this, uh, we've overdosed on the degree of angles, I think, and kind of taken it to an absurdity in my opinion. So, uh, that that distance between the bars i think is probably almost as important and another thing that i think is equally in, important is the rocker and the bar or the rock as you've heard us refer to that so that's that's a a really really important um, aspect of fitting saddle trees on horses backs that's almost never discussed So are you talking about the rocker as in from the front to the back of the tree, the, the amount of curve in the, yeah. in the bars? Yeah, it's that exactly. It's that amount of curve that that is, uh, that accommodates the, the curvature of the, the top line, basically the top line of a horse's back. And, um, so what, what you have, of course, you guys have seen these colts, you know, yearlings, two year olds, sometimes three-year-olds that uh, their top line sometimes is straight as a string. And uh, so are we trying to fit a really, really young horse like that? Or are we trying to fit something that's as their top line starts to drop when they're four or five years old or so? And of course, they're going to maintain that depending on the individual, they're going to maintain a certain curvature to that top line sometimes for the rest of their life. I've got a gelding out here. I think he's what, 18 or so. And I don't think his, that, that top line has changed for probably 10 years, maybe longer. And uh, so, so then there's the debate <laughs> that we have too. And there's going to be, you'll run into a lot of disagreement on this stuff, but, and sometimes at pretty high levels, but 
Um, there's some people that maintain you need to have a little bit flatter bar because because you need to have a certain amount of bridging. So obviously that's just where you got contact on on the front and in the back over the kidney slash loin area with maybe say you put the saddle tree on a horse's back and a little bit of daylight and uh, for the performance horse world some of them maintain well you need to have somewhere for that as you see these sliding stops and all and some of these maneuvers where you've got roundness in that horse's back and so they they say well you need to have a certain amount of uh somewhere for that horse's back to move up into but you pose that question to the people I trust the most, in particular, Dale Harwood and Chuck Storms. And, and I've, I've talked to Clint Haverty. He's a longtime uh, performance horse guy, judge, and, and uh, really, really good leather worker, too, down there in Texas. And, yeah, they don't, they don't advocate uh, any kind of bridging like that and too much of it and you're going to have way too much pressure on the front end of your horse so that's where the, of course majority of your pressure is going to be where your rigging is and all of that mm, that makes sense yeah that makes a lot of sense hey carrie i'm going to hang up for just a minute and reload so i can see joe i'll be right back you know i've never heard uh that take on the um need for bridging on the bars of the tree, I, I always seem to think the m more evenly you could have your weight distributed, the more, um, the, the better it would be for the horse, you know. You, you said it right there, Joe, even distribution of pressure. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Well, you're clearer now, Ben. Yeah. Joe, dude, I'm sorry about that. I'm up here like the mad podcaster with terrible internet, just yakking away. I, I couldn't hear you or see you, but no worries. <laughs> no worries. I thought you were just being, being your usual rude self, but you have an excuse <laughs> <Absolutely>. this time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you gotta make hay while the sun's shining. You know, yeah. Before it gets away from me, Joe, they're, they're talking about. Uh, even distribution of pressure and, and stuff. Warren Wright told me something. It's been a few years ago now. He, he comes over, he's of course from New Zealand and comes over here and, and uh, oh, I don't know, every two or three years or so. I don't see him every time he comes over. But anyway, he, he, uh, he said one thing about rock is that when you, when you have weight in the saddle, your horse's back is going to deflect a little bit. And I never really thought about that. So how much, we, you know, we can't, that's probably gonna depend on the individual horse and stuff, but but uh, it will, we know it will, uh, their, their, their back will, will deflect just a little bit, which would, which in, in some sense, of course, Warren's trees tend to have what most would consider a little bit more rock than most. And I suppose perhaps he was justifying a little bit more rock um, by, by that explanation. Hmm. Yeah, that would make sense too, because, you know, you don't want to huh, that, that almost takes that line of thinking almost takes it away from, you know, when people like trace a horse's back when they're just standing there in the stall or whatever, um, it's almost like you have to modify that then if that that's the correct way of assessing it. Yeah, I don't, I don't, like you say that, how much does it deflect? Yeah, we can't, we can't probably really measure that. Although I guess you could take a bare saddle tree, put it on a horse's back and sit in it and just see, yeah. see what it, what it might do to see what it looks like. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. But, but the, it's way too variable at that point. 
you know, oh, the yeah, white yeah. rider's weight and how strong is the horse and how big is your horse and how long is their back. And y- you'd be chasing that dog forever. See, and that's exactly the deal, uh, Joe. You're, my horses are going to, I'm not feeding hay yet. And, you know, they're, they're going to draw down a little bit here i'll get to feeding some hay here after a little while and stuff but but they're not going to be as fleshy come spring as they will be say 15th of june or so in this country and stuff so i don't grain them i don't normally grain them in the winter time so so even in a a, a, a single animals in in a one year frame of reference you're going to have some different dynamics going on there with that horse's back, how much flesh he's carrying with that. So, so I know I got into a little de- debate with uh, my buddy Fritz uh, Riedel. He's a German saddle maker. He was over here uh, a few years back, and he's writing. A, I don't know. It's kind of got had some health problems and had to put a project on hold. But he was writing a book about the Wade tree which I think would be pretty cool. And uh, I told him, I said, I'm looking for my, uh, I'm trying to give my customers my best average. And and he was a big advocate of the Dennis Lane system and stuff like that. And he said, well, you, you can't identify it. You can't identify an average. And uh, so that's where I'd say these, some of these, these systems like this, and I've got a set of cards that Chuck Storms gave me that I haven't actually put on a horse's back here. But but uh, if you use those cards, I, I would encourage people to use them to try to get that best uh, average dialed in and not not be diving off too, too far in any direction. Yeah, that makes sense. Kerry, what drew you to Warren Wright in the first place? How did you get a connection with him? I I was uh, living in the Idaho Falls area. That was the early 90s. I just moved down there in 92. And, of course, I knew Dale Harwood before that, but he was only 30 minutes away from me or so. His shop was there south of Idaho Falls, and I was – in Idaho Falls for a while and and uh, they knew Dale and Karen knew Warren Wright um, personally they'd been over to New Zealand visited his shop and stuff and and Warren's uh, when you see all of his information and talk to him you come to understand that a lot of his uh, theories and and uh, information has come from Bill Sevier and, and a lot of those tree makers, Walt Youngman coming out of the, the Hamley Pendleton, Oregon tradition. So when you say uh, New Zealand, you, what would this guy know about Western saddle trees? He knows a lot about Western saddle trees. He's learned a lot of what he knows here in the Northwest in the U S well, and through that connection that Dale and Karen, uh, got to know him really well and and he was looking for uh, I think he had been sending some trees to the states but he was looking for some sort of a vehicle where he could he 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 could get some his trees in the hands of some pretty handy people here and and I just happened to be one of them in 1992 I think it was and so 30 years ago um and there was a number of us, Mark Broger, um, Nancy at the time, her name was Nancy Hogan, Nancy Martini. She was, she was one of them. Who else? Uh, there was four or five, four of us, I think. So Gary Dunshee had a big Ben saddlery down in Alpine, Texas. I think he might've been one of them. So I was just one of those handpicked from the very beginning and Dale wanted some reliable, pretty good hands to get these trees out there and stuff. And I just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. (laughs) 
So is Warren, is, is he always, like, he's a native New Zealander, or did he move yeah. to New Zealand? No, he's native. He's native down there. And, okay. And, uh, you know, I probably, I think he did get started learning from maybe, it might have been Fred Harsent, was an old-time uh, Australian saddle maker, tree maker down there. Seems like maybe he got. Hmm. I'm saying more than I should here, but <laughs> I, th- I I don't think he got started here in the states. But I, what really pushed him a lot further was was that whole history of the Ray Holt or not the Ray Holt, the Hamley and Bill Severe. Bill Severe, Dale considers him probably the best tree maker that ever was, and. Uh, so Warren learned a bunch from Bill before he passed away. Hmm. Interesting. It, it's funny how there's this whole, you know, cause you, you hear about the, the horsemanship lineage and all that stuff, but there's kind of the same deal for all the saddle makers and the, um, and the guys who make the trees and, and everything like that, there's all these lines and spheres of influence kind of the same way. Yep. Yep. There is. It's, it's a small world. It really, really is a very small world. Uh, and, uh, yeah. there's, there, there is a, a very, very clear lineage of all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but at the same time, when I started building saddles 40 years ago, that it, it was uh, not a lot of open doors. Um, I think that that uh, <laughs> I'd give you a little little anecdote. I was just talking to Dale here probably a month or so ago, and and uh, on the phone, and and I was asking him about a guy named Bill Knight who was a saddle maker and more known for his flower stamping uh, i won't go into all the detail on him but anyway we're talking about bill knight who worked for hamley's he started out with ray Hole saddle company in in the 40s and uh and we were talking about uh ray holes who who i got to know a little bit uh, back 40 years ago when i started building saddles and and uh of course, Dale knew him really well. In fact, there was one time I was going to school, so I headed up to Spokane, up through Idaho, and up into the Panhandle there, and stopped in to visit Ray. And and he had, he he says we're talking about where I was from. Oh, you probably know Dale Harwood, and and that was the first time I'd ever heard Dale Harwood's name. And uh, at that time, Dale was over on the eastern idaho and i was more in the central southern part and i was more into the foss saddlery capriolas and elko and those were the ones that i knew about and stuff and and uh dale said that uh ray considered there were two saddle makers in idaho at that time dale harwood and ray hole saddle company (laughs) so it's pretty pretty small closed closed group and boy, it's not that way anymore. Um, there's a lot of cross pollination, a lot of information made available to people nowadays that we only dreamt about. So when you started out, like, have you pretty much been like a wade tree guy from the beginning based off of, you know, where you're living and stuff? Or did you like get into making primarily wades later no i uh where i am in idaho up here in the mountains of idaho and much of montana that's that wasn't wade country at all Mm -hmm. it was all swell fork and uh, in the school i oh i don't think i built on on a wade tree although by the time by the time I was getting out of school, finishing up and stuff, I was looking at other influences. Of course, by that time, I knew I knew of uh, Dale, and I started paying attention to what are those guys doing. You know, they're at the top of the food chain. I need to learn something from them. And 
And uh, another guy that you may not have heard about it, he's another Severe, his name is Bob Severe. And I think I, I ordered a tree, I started ordering trees from him even before I got out of school. And uh, he was making some hand-built trees down in uh, southern Idaho, not far from where. And I'd, I'd met him in the leather shop in 1979. I was just a fresh-faced kid in the shop, so I never really met him and got to know him. But he was a friend of the guy I worked for. And uh, Bob Severe is making a pretty decent tree. I don't know if he's doing it anymore. He's getting a little age on him now. But... but uh, I built, uh, I think I built a saddle for myself was on what he called a way tree, which of course you guys understand it. Uh, and Dale would say this, there's saddle trees out there that they're calling a way, but the only similarity they have is their name. <laughs> they're, they're <laughs> fun that they, there's not, they don't have, they don't check the boxes on what we would consider the classic way which would be that five inch wood, you know, front to back, five inches in the wood and lowering the base of the horn. Uh, so all of that stuff, you know, there, there's way trees out there that no way are they any, any resemblance of what, what the original wave was. Here's a divisive question while you're talking about that, about the trees, Carrie, is, um, I mean, people can like whatever style they like, but in terms of practicality, a lot of guys are doing a, a little bit taller, smaller horn in diameter, just like a little post horn on a wade, on a wade tree versus like a large Guadalajara style, you know, five and a half inch horn with some tilt on it. What do you think is more effective in terms of, of roping and working outside? You know, that's where, that's where, uh, Chuck would say that you know, a lot of it comes down to how big is the neck. And, and, uh, Chuck would say you need to have probably at least two and a half inches of wood in order to have the strength you, you need. So, so when you have two and a half inch neck and you have only a three inch cap, well, it looks like a beer can and you get it all wrapped up and finished and stuff like that. But there's functionally for roping. Yeah, you can stack more. If you got a bigger cap, you can stack more wrap, more of a wrap. But like these Warren right? I'm looking over here to Ray Hunt tree, which is basically the same as a, the same as a, a wade, except for that it's, it's more spare front to back. Doesn't have that lip out in front. It's got the same size neck. It's got a smaller, smaller cap. It's probably got a three and a half inch cap on it. So the neck size is actually the same. So you can stack more wraps when you got a bigger cap. You know, you just got more area to fill in below that cap. And then each dally, of course, you've got more rope bearing on, on the neck of the horn. So for slick horn ropers, which of course is what most of, most of my customers are not arena ropers, then, then, uh, that bigger, that bigger horn is going to make for more bearing surface per dally. So that's just a basic physics deal, but, uh, yeah, it's it's probably a marginal marginal deal. I don't know that it's you know you, you hear some guys talk about catching the backside of their hand, you know, on a big horn and stuff like that. And it's all in what you get used to. If you're used to one thing, um, yeah, you know, I'm not going to stand in judgment of one way or the other. That, that does bring up another another deal that that is kind of interesting though is that you have uh, do we make choices on our saddles because of the way that the way it looks or the way it functions and I would make the case that 
if if you could get somebody to admit it, that bigger horn just looks better. I mean, to me, it looks, doesn't it look classic? Hell when yeah. You tip that front end up just a little bit. It just looks punchy. Oh, yeah. Doesn't it? Oh, yeah. What's wrong with that? I mean, I would, I would venture to say it looks. As long as it functions like we want it. Yeah, I would venture to say it looks sexy almost. Yeah. If I was going to say it, if I was that kind of person. But yeah, oh, for sure. Tip back a little bit. Absolutely. Big old Absolutely. horn. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and to me, you know, why why do we do so many things with our horses? Of course, you you got you want them to break at the pole. You want them to, you know, to to soften up at the pole, and it looks good. Well, it functions good too. You know, you got a collected horse and all of that kind of stuff. And and uh, but to me, the with regard to horsemanship and and saddles. The combination, the blend that we're after is art and function. Whether And of course, when we think of art, we think of flowers and that sort of thing. But when we, you bring up the question, Ben, about this, the size of the horn, I'm just saying it looks cool. And there's nothing, there's <laughs> not a damn thing wrong with cool when it comes to that. As long as you're not doing something that's going to be, that's not going to function, that's going to be problematic that way. So same way with square skirts or rounded skirts or, you know, just different things like that. If it looks good and it functions well, you got something. Yeah. Yeah. No, hundred percent. And part of that goes back to, um, well, we were talking about football. You ever heard the expression, um, you look good, you feel good, you feel good, you play good? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, if you're, you know, out there doing a job and and you feel like you're, you know, you feel like you're a big deal because you got your good-looking saddle and things like that, you're probably – obviously it'd help if you'd have the skill to back it up, but you're probably more apt to more apt to, you know, be a little handier that day because you feel handy and you're nice mm-hmm. saddle, you know? Absolutely. I, I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, that puts a little truth to the, the old saying looking good's half the battle puts a little grit and truth to that. Hundred percent, and and looking good doesn't have to be, you know, nosebleed, over the top, decorated to the nines kind of thing. And I I know Chaz Weldon. I remember years ago said something. I don't know where we were. Uh, said he said if you can make a rough out saddle look like a work of art, then you've done something. And I've always remembered that because it has to do with the architecture. The, what Chuck Storms would say, the architecture of a saddle, the lines of the saddle. If you can make that figure, that form, look good on the back of a horse, and whatever decoration, that's, that's icing. That's icing on the cake. I agree 100%. That's awesome. I like that perspective yeah that's half the fun when you get in some ratty looking colt to start and you get him going a little bit and then when you clean him up and put a nice saddle on him and he's loping around the round corral moving out with a saddle for the first time man there's nothing that looks better than that something about that it kind of an ugly looking horse can look real good with a nice fitting saddle that's well broke in and Got a good looking saddle pad under it and a nice silhouette from the side. Like you're saying, that even just a simple rough out, if the lines are correct and it's got a big horn, of course, man, nothing, nothing looks better than that. It's cowboy pride. It's, it just has to do with the pride, pride in ownership of your equipment, pride in the, your horses and how you take care of them, the, the whole package. It's all about cowboy pride. 
I, I always, it's mm. always fun when I build a saddle for somebody and, and you might hear back from them after they've gone to a roping or a clinic or a branding or something like that. And of course it's, Oh, who made your saddle? And all of that kind of chatter goes on. Where'd you get that McCarty? Uh, what about that head stall? What about who did the silver on this? Whatever. And, and it's all, all people. It's, it's show and tell. And, and I think it's awesome. I think all that stuff is awesome. Yeah. Well, speaking of pride in your work, how's your hardware deal going? I think around the time you made that saddle for me, you, you put your hardware on there and you were just starting to get some, some stuff made and you were kind of going all American made. Did I, did we put some of that hard, new hardware on your side? Yeah. I, Cause I remember you sent me pictures of prototypes and then you sent me something else, but like it was early on, like you gave me the option to have like the, the hardware on there that I think maybe your son had cut out or, or something. It was a kind of a early prototype you showed me on the phone. Mm -hmm. But, uh, are, are you pretty much using all American made now? Well, it's, it's, we can't call it a business. Well, the, the rigging hardware is definitely all American made, which is kind of getting tougher to come by, but I can't say that I'm in the hardware business cause I, I'm, I kind of have to, uh, talk my son into cutting out some more. I just talked to him today. He's got, he's cutting some on his CNC. It's, it's. 304 stainless cut on a computer numerically controlled mill. It's a computer. Uh, and you, you guys probably heard about that before, but a lot of people my age, probably a CNC machine is CNC. What? <laughs> it's just a, a computer controlled mill is what it is. And, and, uh, we cut those out of, uh, 304 stainless billet material. So it's, it's a little harder than the cast stuff that most people use nowadays. Not that it needs to be harder. It, cast stainless is certainly more, more than it needs to be. But, um, but yeah, we've got that going and, and a lot of your hardware is about a full quarter inch thick and we've shaved, a little bit off a 16th I think off so it's a little bit thinner maybe a little bit lighter but not but not uh not any it's not any less strong it's more strong than the other stuff that we've been able to get and uh so yeah we're a little bit of innovation going on with the where most hardware's out there the where you the rivet holes are where you rivet through that's the, and the hardware, that's the thickest part of the hardware. And so underneath those stirrup leathers, where you get a lot of that abrasion from the movement of the stirrup leather in a very short period of time, you wind up with those copper, if you're using copper rivets, those rivet heads are gone. And you and I may have talked about this. I don't remember now, but, but so I, came up with this idea of counter boring. There's a little, it's only about, it's not even a 16th of an inch, I don't think, but it's just enough to countersink the head of that rivet down below grade. So your stirrup leathers don't wear that. So little things like that. And I know that um, nowadays, a lot of people would say that, well, it's, I get asked this a lot. Well, do you ride? Have you ridden very much and stuff like that? And yeah, some, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not the horseman. I wish I were and stuff like that. Of course, the question is that people equate having, uh, somebody who's ridden knows what they're talking about when it comes to the using the equipment. Well, that's one of those little innovations where, uh, having repaired a fair number of saddles and 
seeing saddles of my own where those rivets have, that's where innovation, there's an opportunity for that when you're out there using your stuff. So it's only a matter of time before that idea catches on. I am not patenting the idea or anything, but it's a small little innovation that's pretty easy to, it'd be really, really easy to build that uh, cast counterboard feature in there so the heads of your rivets are below grade and as people i i haven't had i haven't tried to hide it or anything now you guys are gonna make it famous out there by your podcast and everybody's gonna <laughs> know about it yeah well, I, all 15 i hope people. so <laughs> i hope so i'll back that thing up 100 percent, gary so. because even if it was an idea you had, I mean, that saddle you made me, I've been riding the snot out of it. And it's alongside other saddles where that those rivets are starting to wear the head off. And that saddle you made me, boy, those rivets, they don't even have any shine on them. I mean, they're sitting right below the surface. So 100%, that is a, yeah. that is a small improvement, but a big deal, at least for a guy. Um, like me or I think any other young guy out there that's buying a saddle as a young man and you're going to, you already ride a lot and you want to keep it for a long time and not want to have to send it back to get repaired for a long time. Shoot. I, I think that's great. I think that's a great improvement. Well, you said it earlier. That's a small improvement. It's, it's not a deal breaker. You know, it's not, not to say that all the other ones are bad. I mean, I, that's the way I, I've done it that way for years and years. I just was thinking one day and I think I was even talking to my son one time on the phone and he's a really, really sharp operator and stuff. I don't even know. I, we were trying to get this hardware deal going and, and stuff and, and he doesn't want to make any hardware for anybody else. Uh, so it's not a business. It's just a father and son thing, but I think I was on the phone and I got to thinking of how we could improve this design and idea came to me and stuff, but, uh, that's what you wind up it with. And that, what we were talking about earlier, kind of camping on the edge of your abilities and always looking, you're in a problem solving mode all the time so you're trying to think of how can i do this a little better a little make it my time efficiency better and have it better quality and and uh, all of that stuff in a way that you're serving your customers that's the bottom line yeah well and that goes back to what i was asking you about at the very beginning because it's that thinking ahead and you can see it in your work it comes across uh you know, Bill does an internship deal here, so we often have um, young people coming through and staying with us. And someone asked me recently, because they were trying to keep up and, you know, do their jobs and kind of get better at stuff. And she kept saying, what What do I need to do? Or, or how come this isn't working? Or what should I do? And and I just shared with her what I've been, what I've been taught, and, and I struggle at it. But I said, you just got to think ahead. I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to do every day. And the guys that I look up to that I saw working and thought, man, I want to be like them. That's what they said. You, the basis of it is you got to think ahead. And if you're not using your thinking cap, then you can't expect, you know, you can't expect that your brute force is going to get anything done. You got to use your head. You got to think ahead. And so when it comes to having a productive day and, you know, getting things done, getting your little list done or, getting things done in a way that things work out and are successful. You got to think ahead and the same with your saddle making like a little improvement, like that rivet. That's, that's thinking ahead for when you would have to repair it or not repair it. And you know, the same way you might drive your equipment or, or the way we work with horses. It's a lot of thinking ahead so that you prevent something versus get to the point where it's all messed up. And now you've got to, now you got to kind of tear the whole thing out and replace it instead of take care of it, you know, before what happens happens. So I appreciate that. Every time I look at that saddle you made me, I look at your stitching and 
just all the little things that go into making a saddle because that's a handmade piece of artwork made out of leather and glue and wood and rawhide and I mean if you think of the components of a saddle it doesn't sound like a lot of things that would be great at riding every day and having in the rain and the weather and lasting you know 100 years but I guess when a craftsman puts that together with some forethought and thinks ahead he can put all those ingredients together and makes this piece of art that's extremely useful and durable and can last a long time all because that the maker thought ahead about each component as he put it together. No, I, I think, Ben, you just identified another commonality, I think, between craftsmanship and horsemanship, and that is uh, fundamentals. Uh, you've got to, you, you never, ever neglect fundamentals. And, and uh, when you, and that's one thing I, I talk about. I've got some DVDs that I sell too, and and uh, talk about quite a bit is to it's just something as basic as the shape of your cannel, uh, the uh, Cheyenne roll. Say there's <clears throat> there's four layers of leather inside that binding, and every layer one built upon another. So you pay attention to that very first layer and get it right then the rest of them will stack on there naturally. And the same way with, with horses, you, you get your fundamentals down, you get, you check the boxes on before you getting in any hurry or anything like that. And, uh, I know with my deal, I, with my horses, I got one that, you know, I'm still sorting some crap out, some mistakes that I made. 12 years ago, you know, I'm trying to, I'm still trying to fix some stuff that I messed up on that. So if I had known better, if I had done better back then and got my fundamentals sorted out, I wouldn't be having this trouble right now. So there's, there's, that's when in my classes, people probably get tired of hearing me talk about the, the, the parallels between horsemanship and and craftsmanship and artistry for that matter. Yeah. Boy, the two no doubt go hand in hand. Absolutely. hundred percent. Well, Carrie, this has been a really, really fun conversation, man. Um, I like I've known, you know, I already knew I liked talking to you the, brief times we've talked on the phone and stuff but it's really cool to see uh your insight and all this and again like we talked about uh how how you think about learning and how you think about the parallels with horsemanship um it it's really cool to see that man and i think a lot of people will appreciate that point of view well hopefully um you put a nickel in and you got a quarter out of me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I can already tell we're going to have to have you back um, at some point And we'll, you know, maybe maybe when you get your podcast up and running, we'll do some cross promotion or something. Sure. No, that'd, that'd be good. I, I'm i probably not going to be as ambitious as you guys. I don't. The once a week deal, I... Uh, I have to be really careful. One of the great demons I have is getting too many irons in the fire. And uh, so my son promises me that he's got a little podcast going with a knife maker, a friend of his, and and uh, he's a knife maker. And, and uh, so they they chirp about stuff every so off every couple of weeks or something like that. And he says, oh, the only thing he got into it is the time he got visiting with somebody. So I hope that's true, but mine's probably going to be more like once a once a month at least to get going here. And and uh, I I actually have I just got my microphone. I see you guys got those fancy microphones there. I got one of those. I haven't even unboxed yet. So but it's going to oh. happen one way or another. Well, good. We're good. We're looking forward to it. You definitely. Um, yeah absolutely you're plus you got that good 
good deep voice too. You you're kind of already a gifted orator. You can tell you teach to people. Well, I it's it'll be twenty years next month when I taught my first class. I got invited to go to Elko and and I'd never taught a class like that at all. And, and uh, shoot, I had David Rigby and Kent Frecker and quite a bunch of people in that class. That was the very first class I taught, and I didn't know what I was doing, but. I just packaged it in a way that I hope people understood and the evaluations came back overwhelmingly positive. So I, hmm, maybe there's a future for me here. So and I do like teaching. Yeah, good. Well, it, it's like everything, you know, riding, riding horses for people, saddles, all, all that stuff. All, all you can do is the best you can do. And then, you know, let what other people say about your work speak for itself, you know. So, I I know you're uh, you're highly touted in that world, and at everything I've ever seen you, uh, like you know, like Ben Saddle, everything I've ever seen that you've made has been exceptionally impressive, in my opinion. So, yeah, I think well, you. I think you'll be, yeah, I, I think you'll be fine with a podcast. You just seem like the type of person who you figure out how to be good at what you do. Just try to be a student of whatever it is. Hey, uh, Carrie, if you would, for the good folks, uh, tell them how to get a, get a hold. Well, find you if they want to get on your Patreon deal or get a saddle, look you up. What's the best way to find you? Well, I, on my website, I think that uh, we do have a button on there that just says Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And uh, I'll put a plug every once in a while on Instagram, Facebook. I'm not near as active on there as I used to be. But, uh, um, but yeah, on the website. Or, or you can go to Patreon. You just go to the website. It's, it's a platform almost it looked it's a lot like social media um the downside about patreon it's kind of like a, you have to buy in in order to see anything and i i'd like to be able to show some free content from on there so people have an idea of what it is what am i even buying i don't even know what i'm buying so, yeah so for now, they don't have any kind of free content on there. So you kind of have to go on there and do a search. You'd have to put my name in there and find find me on there. Yeah. So, and it's, and the, the idea of it, I think, was that for artists, craftsmen, whatever, who are looking for what they call crowdsourcing, they're just looking for support. Uh, people send them a few bucks a month. Well, I... I'm approaching it completely from an education standpoint. It's paid content. It's, it's kind of like, uh, what Isaac and Noah are doing and Buck's got, the, got the channel going and stuff. It's, it's a similar deal. Paid content. So. Well, I know some people have done that though. They put out a little teaser, like part of the video and then write it. A very riveting moment. The video stops and a little icon pops up and says, if you'd like to continue yeah. watching this, you have to go sign up at the Patreon. That way they get a little taste. They yeah. kind of wet their whistle and then they get mm -hmm. stopped at a, at a cliffhanger. And then like most of us Americans, we go, we got to have it yeah. and we go there and we buy it. So yeah. that, that might be a cool idea. Yeah, that's, I need, I need to do more of that kind of thing, but, uh, yeah, I'm, my time, my day's so carved up these these days, it seems like I'm having a hard time keeping up with all this stuff. But the Patreon thing, if I could twitch my nose and have all of my so-called followers subscribe at five bucks a month, it'd be, that'd be awesome. But not everybody wants to, people are used, when they're used to free content, they, they kind of, kind of like that. So having to pay for any content is a bit of a stretch, but, uh, and it's, it's working. I like it. It's working pretty good. 
Well, I think you're doing pretty good keeping up with the tech and all. I mean, I've, I have no idea what Patreon even is, really, so I'll have to check it out. But you're you're keeping right up there with the times, man. Um, good deal. Not too shabby for an old guy. I just turned 63 last week. So I'm young enough. That I'm kind of counting on it for a while, but I'm old enough to it's really, really hard, I'll tell you that, trying to navigate all this stuff. <laughs> Would you describe yourself at the edge of your abilities, Carrie? I absolutely. It's uh, <laughs> a lot of this tech stuff is way beyond my abilities. So, yeah. so I, have, I have to, I don't have any help with any of this stuff. So I got a I got I'm filming from my Patreon stuff all all on my own editing, uploading all of that stuff. I learned pretty much completely on my own and uh so hmm. it's cool but i didn't sign up for that but it's just what you have to do oh yeah ben and i understand yeah we sure do well the edge of your abilities is where continual growth happens absolutely Absolutely. The energy is right on the edge of your abilities. That's where the energy happens. Absolutely. And that's what, that's, you know, like I said earlier, the thing that I, I, when you're operating at the edge of your abilities, when you understand the dynamics of that, I think then you can start throwing sticks on that fire. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's a great note to end on. That's that's advice I'll be putting in the bank. But Gary Schwartz, we've appreciated it. Thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Take care. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.